So uh, today is a Sunday where I always feel like um, I should be a little bit careful, maybe, um, because uh, in the in these series of weeks during our pledge season, uh, we're looking at these words of service, words of give, invite, and grow, and and looking at how they apply for us, and not just uh, in uh, in our regular lives, but especially at this time as we're looking towards this capital campaign and and who we are hoping to become as a church. And this morning's word is give. And I know everyone always loves it when a preacher starts talking about giving, right? I mean, I know myself, there's a, there's a couple of uh, old tropes that come, in, that come to mind as soon as I start even thinking about this. And uh, you, might know, uh, you might know what these are. You've heard this before. You know, the uh, preacher is standing up in front. The ushers are out. The offering plates are going through the congregation. The pianist is playing just as I am. Remember that old hymn, just as I am without one plea. This song goes on forever. Uh, you know, we, we're so, we've, got, we've got that going. And, they, and the ushers bring the offering plates forward. The preacher looks down and he looks back up at the congregation and says, these plates aren't full enough. We're going to send these back around another time. We're going to keep singing this hymn. And we're going to keep going until I think those plates are full right where they should be. And, and then the, the second part of that one that I always think of, uh, the preacher gives out that tried and true Bible verse. Anyone know which one it is? Thinking about giving. And the one that comes out and uh, says this, God loves a cheerful giver. Right? Um, that is exactly where my brain goes. And I'm a preacher, and I think that whenever I get ready to start talking about, uh, about preaching. Uh, so, a few things to know about this. Uh, one, this actually is a Bible verse, and, and I feel like I need to say that because sometimes we say things come out of the Bible that don't actually come out of the Bible, but this is a verse in there, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7c. Remember that, see, it's going to become important as we kind of uh, move into things. Uh, the main thing is, don't worry, I'm not going to pass the plates again. Because in order to pass the plates again, it would imply that we had passed them a first time. And we haven't passed the plates for a while. Um, and we do, that, we do that for good reason. We started that during the pandemic of uh, not passing anything any more than we needed to. But as we kind of went on, it began to make a whole lot of sense. Because we talk about our offerings, and they're more encompassing than just what we give to the offering plate. So we talk about our offerings during our time of prayer. Of a, we talk about our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness, and all of that is a part of the offerings that we make to God. Uh, and so that's when we, uh, we kind of left them up here, but as a part of our giving, we come and we make our offerings to God in that way. Um, for me, it makes a whole lot more uh, theological sense and fits better with who we are. Um, so don't worry, we aren't going to pass the plates again. Um, Crystal, do you even know just as I am without one plea? She's looking at me like, you aren't going to want me to play this, are you? Don't worry, no, that's a... We're going to sing that, so don't worry, we're not going to, we're not going to, I'm not going to inflict that on you. Um, and not that I have anything against that hymn. It is a wonderful, beautiful hymn that I enjoy singing very much. But it gets used in some very trite sorts of situations and overused in uh, many other ways. Um, but this morning, we are, we are going to, we're going to ask this question, though. Have you ever stopped to ask, why do we give? I mean, it's not just to support the church. If we were just giving to support an organization, there are lots of opportunities to do that because you all know what they are because you all are a part of a lot of those organizations all over town and in many places far away where we give to support the missions of, of those places. But in the church, as a part of our faith, we give for more reasons than that. Um, let's go back to this verse, though, that preachers love. God loves a cheerful giver. But let's take this, so let's, let's take a step let's go and put it back into the context of where we find it because uh, it, it's okay for us to take parts of verses out and use them, but we have to do that always remembering what they are a part of. So let's go to all of verse 7 there. There's more to it than just that one line. Uh, this is all of verse 7. Everyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver giver. Today we're going to take a look at what does it mean to give? And what does that look like as a part of uh, this pledge season that we're in and this capital campaign that we are doing? And what does it mean for us as a church for where we are going in the future? 
And so we take a look at this verse that is so very popular in so many different ways. Um, but we remember that we have to remember where it comes from. Sometimes I think it also helps to, uh, uh, to remember kind of how it is that we, that we structure our Bible. Have you, ever, have you ever stopped to think that our Bible is an amazing reference book that is organized in a way that makes it, when you know how it works, it makes it so very easy to find a whole wealth of things um, that would otherwise be very difficult to find and to look up and to, and to do something with. And so we've got this structure, like you have your book name, you have a chapter, and then a colon, and then a, and then, and then a verse or verses in there, and then sometimes you have that letter that gets on the end. Um, you aren't ever going to find that letter in any of your Bible that's more of a, any of your Bibles that's more of a modern thing that we have started doing to tell us, oh, in what part of the verse are we in? Now, most of the time, that is, we're in part A or B. It tells us to look at the beginning of the verse or the last part of the verse. Remember, as we looked at that this morning, we had C, that, C that was up there, right? Um, there are three parts to this verse in... Uh, um, in, our, in the Common English Bible, which is the translations that we use uh, for worship on Sunday mornings, that has three separate sentences that uh, block out verse 7. Verse, and other translations that you might read, they keep one whole sentence, but they block everything off with commas, so you know that there's uh, three different parts there. But regardless of which we're using, it comes out like this. Part A, everyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. Part B, they shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. Part C, God loves a cheerful giver. So let's take this and begin to put this into some context. Paul writes and he says that we should give whatever we have decided in our heart. Meaning to give out of our convictions of what is good and what is right. And that starts us on a journey. Starts us on a journey of giving. Now we're going to spend some more time looking at what does it mean for good and right but know that's where we're starting. And then Paul says, don't give out of pressure or hesitation. Don't give out of uh, even the concerns that we might have. Those are things that all need to be addressed, but what Paul is building into us is a mindset of how and why that we give to look at the world with a different set of eyes. You've heard me say this before, and, uh, and I will probably say it again, and that is uh, too often as churches, we have a, a scarcity type of mindset that we approach things from. I pick on churches because churches are what I know best. You can see this in, in most any organization you've ever been a part of. Those times when we become really focused on making sure we have enough, uh, we don't let loose of things that, uh, uh, that, uh, that we're afraid we might run out of. And that mindset leads to worry, to concern, to hesitation, and to pressure. Scarcity isn't the way that we should be looking at the world. Now, we do have to realize and know that there are going to be some limitations and there are going to be some boundaries of the things that are around us. That is a good and healthy part of, of anything that we do when we give. But it can't be the, over, the overriding thing that begins to be in charge of everything. That leads us into that place of scarcity. And those things then mean that we can't be, as Paul uh, sums everything up with, uh, a cheerful giver. Cheerful, this last line here, is not the place that we start, but it is the end of uh, what Paul is describing here. Cheerful here isn't talking about a Santa Claus kind of giving. We're not giving out of a belly full of jelly. We're not, uh, we're not giving uh, by putting on a smile and feigning happiness. Cheerful is the result of all these other parts. Cheerful is the alignment of what we have decided in our hearts as good and right. Cheerful is the alignment of being able to give without hesitation or pressure. Cheerful is our engagement with the Holy Spirit such that it's not just us that are aligned with ourselves and our own thoughts and our own beliefs, but that we have also aligned with what God wants to be done in this world. The whole thing that God is putting together, that Paul is giving to us. Now let's begin to take this another step farther. We go into our scripture reading for this morning. We're now into the, into the book of Romans, and we start in verse 9, and Paul writes this. He says, Love should be shown without pretending to hate evil and hold on to what is good. 
This is, if not Paul's last letter, it's one of his last letters that we have, uh, that we at least have recorded that he wrote. This is Paul at his most mature theologically as he is writing these things and these things out. And this is another way that Paul puts out there and says, God loves a cheerful giver. But then he goes on to explain how, what does that look like? What does it mean to, um, to have that conviction of what is good and right, to know what we have decided with our hearts? To get here, Paul tells us we have to live out the lives and these ideals and to recognize the Spirit as work when we see it. So he gives us the starting point that we need. Um, we're going to go to the second part of verse 10. So just one verse after this, the second part of this. You've already seen this part once this morning. Uh, we have give, that's where we are today. But that second part, this is part B of verse 10. Be the best at showing honor to each other. Specifically, Paul says, uh, to love each other like members of your own family. That's the first part of this verse. And so he says, honor each other. Honor each other as parts of our own families. But how do we do that? What does that look like? To be able to show that kind of honor requires a good amount of humility. Um, that says that someone else's needs, wants, and desires are as important as my own. Not more important, not less important, but as important as my own. That makes life a little bit more challenging in some ways. But that's what it begins to look like to honor others. And this passage out of Romans begins to play, uh, play that out even more. What more does this look like? The first thing is always to be serving God. And that happens through every part of our lives. Serving God is a lifelong endeavor that we aren't always going to get right, but that's why God gives us grace, knowing that we aren't always going to do it well, but that he is going to uh, make sure that we have the opportunity to continue on over and over again to work towards that. Because practically what serving God does is it gives us some place to focus outside of ourselves because not only is God with us along in this journey, but God is also giving us the direction to go. And when we have something that we can focus on, the direction that we can, that we can point towards, that gives us also something that we all desperately need, some accountability for what is good and right, at least in God's eyes, that we are driving towards. So many times when we see folks and individuals and organizations and even churches get into trouble, it's because they have lacked that accountability. And it's just not been there. But God gives us what we need so that we can go in that direction and holds us accountable to that. But also, in doing that, gives us hope. Hope that is the very thing that is stronger than every bad or dark thing that can happen in this world, whether it is something done to us, something that we have done to ourselves, something we have done to others, or something that has just happened. That hope is not going to say that everything is going to be uh, good and easy for the rest of our lives, but says that when those dark and bad things happen, that God is there to help us to overcome them in, and in ways that are unavailable to folks that don't have faith. The next part starts then in verse 13. It starts with contributing to the needs of God's people and says, welcome, to welcome the strangers into your home. And, and I want to read the next couple of verses there. Bless people who harass you. Bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal and don't think that you're better than anyone else. I could spend a lot of time just in those few verses just unpacking that piece by piece by piece. There's a lot there, but there's, there's an image I want to draw out of that that I think Paul is describing. There's lots of images we could go with that there, but the one that sticks for me in this moment is that God is calling us to build lives of faith, to create a home, but not a normal home, but work to work uh, to create the best home that we can, one that listens to the needs of others, that provides a place where all are welcome, that provides comfort and strength, that provides accountability, and that shows honor to each other. Now, this isn't an easy thing that God is calling us to. In the prayer that we used to uh, use to start worship out uh, with, and we uh, still use in other parts of our, of our life as a church, we would say, come Holy Spirit, Come show us how we can be the spiritual heart of this community. We could also say the spiritual home of this community. At that point, those terms are interchangeable. So what does that look like? That's what, as a church, that we are giving towards. 
creating, in many ways, recreating that heart, that home. This is always an ongoing process of things that we do. Just as our own families aren't the same now as they were a year ago, or five years ago, or ten years ago, or thirty years ago, so the life of our church isn't the same today as it was uh, those many years ago. So we're in a time now of creating and recreating who God wants us to be. And it's what, it's, that's the, the hope of this capital campaign. And where we are going is that we are recreating this space for a new time and a new, and a new, uh, and a new life going forward. It's why we uh, have in the back and up here on the side, there are brochures that kind of explain more of this. It's why we're having the informational sessions, one after church today, um, uh, to explain some more about this and to answer questions. Um, but the broad strokes of what we're doing is that we are creating a heart or a home for God's people here. The first part in phase one are the big things that help us to renovate the basic structures and needs that we have as a church that, that cover the inside of our sanctuary in here, that brings it up to date, that takes care of some uh, many things that need to be taken care of, um, uh, that takes care of stuff in the entryway here in the center where, you know, for many years we had some water issues that are now all taken care of, but when, now it needs to take care of the interior to get that all uh, fixed and put back into, into good place. And takes care of the HVAC system back in the, in the education wing. I know that's not a super attractive thing that most folks will ever think about unless you are a preacher and you think about these kinds of things. Um, but uh, uh, the, uh, we stop and think that is the original system that was put in back in 1980. And for the most part, it still works. The air conditioning doesn't, but everything else still works on it and is still up there and running. Um, but it is a big piece that will need to be taken care of and all of this is going to be part of a major reset for us, and in some ways, very visible. And when we do this well, we'll have set these pieces up, not just for now, not just for the next generation, but for the many generations that are still to come. Phase two starts getting us into how we're going to, what we're, uh, excuse me, starts to set up for us um, all that's going to happen after that. It takes us into what we need to really look at, what we really need to look at to build that home. At a bare minimum, it means that we're going to be, you know, taking care of walls and flooring and lighting and some of those things. But that's the bare minimum. That's only the starting point. We'll also be finishing out what we've got going uh, in our backyard back there. Well, we've got the ark that's back there. We've got the garden that's back there. We've talked about, uh, you know, this uh, pavilion that we want to put in that we can use for outdoor worship and weddings and events. And all of that is to make an invitation to folks that are around us that this is a home that they also can be a part of. Remember last week, uh, um, Emily and I didn't talk about this before she gave her children's message last week. She just did that, and, and it kind of and it fit really well. Um, she said that there are a lot of folks that, uh, that struggle walking into a church building. And that's true whether we've got great big concrete stairs like we have out here, or I had a church one time that had a little half stair, um, but also had a nice gently sloping ramp that went all the way down. So that ramp uh, went out for about 10 feet, but only went up like 3 inches. That can be an incredibly big step for folks to take, even on that one. But what we're creating out here is a place where folks can easily come in and begin to see what we are doing and who we are as a church and as this family that God is pulling together. So that's part of the work is finishing that. Um, but also because we don't expect to start work on phase two for a while, we're going to be taking time through November and probably the first of the year to really evaluate and understand uh, what we need to do in the rest of the building. It's one thing just to bring things up to date, but what else do we need? How do our rooms need to be configured? What kind of rooms do we need to plan for? How are they going to be used? Um, we have a once in a several generation uh, opportunity to really prepare <coughs> for what is coming. Just as those who came before us built this church many, many, many years ago. And then later, after that, 42 years ago, folks built the education wing on the, other, on the, the back part of the church over here. Now is our opportunity to say that we know God is at work here, to listen for how his spirit is leading us and what to do, 
and to make those preparations to prepare this place for the generations that are still to come. Now, when you look at that brochure, uh, you'll notice that there's a phase three on there that doesn't have anything listed. Um, that's the big dream phase. That's the one where we might have some like vague ideas of something now, something that's in our thoughts and in our prayers. Uh, might be things that come out in our planning that we know we can't do, that we can't handle right now, but we want to keep someplace to know that, that they're there, that those might be important. They may come up in conversations that you have with folks around town and around the community and around the area about things. They say, you know, we wish someone would do this, or, uh, or just they might say something that says, ooh, we need to hold on to that because that's something that I think we might be able to do, or at least we need to take a look at as a church. Um, phase three is still a long way off. But we can begin that kind of process of dreaming of what that might be. Gifts that take us through phases one and two and even into phase three will help us to see true transformation, truly really transformational work in our community. When we're asking to give, this is what we're giving towards. To becoming this home, this heart, right here at the entrance to the heart of Marceline. Sometimes uh, it, still, it still amazes me that, uh, that, you know, that downtown Marceline is the heart of this community. If you've ever been to a lot of other small towns, you know that most downtowns do not look like this. They don't function like this. They don't have as much going on as is down there. And especially if they're not like a county seat and there's no courthouse down there. And yet we come to Marceline and there's a vibrant, active, uh, thriving heart to this community that is just down the block from us. And as folks are coming into town, the entrance to that starts right here at this intersection. Giving... Uh, giving our gifts to this time in this place helps to, uh, to bring that heart and that home together. As we are looking to where we are going, we're starting to have a vision of what that's going to mean. But we aren't quite there yet in knowing what it will completely look like. So join in this journey as we give, and as we do so as God calls us to do, as we do so in ways that God, that Christ is already beginning to show us how that's at work. Let us give in this time, in this place, for this time and place and the times and places still to come. And let us give in Christ's name. Amen.